you. Okay. Um, we're going to hear a song by Brother DC called Tears of Joy, and we will be right back for everyone. I am humbled by the blessings of God in my life. I do. God bless you. I would love to hear your testimony and um, maybe you can even tie in the song like where God has helped you cry tears of joy um, for all that he's done in your life. First of all, let me say that uh, God is not looking for weak soldiers. He's looking for strong soldiers. And the way he determines that is that he brings us through tests and trials. He wants to see how faithful we are in him. He wants to see how tough we are in him. Um, there's so much that I can uh, uh, share with you, but, but some of the greatest uh, challenges is, have you been a person that has been misunderstood that people really don't give you a chance to really be who you are because they see something in you, a great potential that cannot be explained. And then that you get judged, you get ridiculed, you get mocked, you're not included. All of these things had happened to me because I have chosen to stand for the truth not just any truth, but the truth of God's word. 
And because of that, I have gained friends and I gained a lot of enemies. But one thing is important is, is that no matter what happens during this life, my life, the life that God had designed for me, and I would continue to stand on God's word in this context. So how does God make us into one of his strong soldiers? If you look throughout the Bible, you notice that a lot of the people that God has chosen, uh, he brought them through the fire, through trials and tribulations. Well, I'm no different from any other person that God has chosen. For example, um, still to this day, I've been misunderstood for my stance on a lot of issues, and that includes spirituality. And I have chosen to continue this route because that's where God wanted me to be. And then that comes with a lot of challenges. And because of that, sometimes I feel like I have to do things on my own. Um, it gets lonely at the top sometimes, you know, either you're in the valley or you're top of the mountain. You feel like that you are alone and you feel like that you have to figure things out for yourself. And that's when I have an opportunity to talk to the Lord a lot. He's really the only friend that I have. And going back to the verse that was just read, uh, the first couple of verses of the first chapter of Psalm, is that it's so important that we seek divine, godly counsel. Um, I preached about this a couple of weeks ago about the fact that you just can't go to anybody and everybody to talk to everybody because people will use your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities and they will try to use it to destroy you. That has happened to me a lot. You know, at times I really didn't know who to turn to or, or who to talk to because I felt that who can I trust? What person on earth could I possibly trust? Who can I be vulnerable with? And it even got to the point that uh, people started putting labels on me that does not really define me at all. And did it make me upset? Yes. Uh, was I uh depressed absolutely but some of our people you know would tell me you know you got to figure this on your own you know you got to stand on your own two feet you know you is it was really difficult to ask for that kind of help because i didn't know who to trust i didn't know who to to lean on well when you have a conversation with the lord he would guide you to the right person. He will guide you to the right circumstances. He will tell you what to do. As a matter of fact, he will also help you go through the storm. He never said that he was going to remove the storm. I mean, he's God. He can remove the storm if he chooses to. That's how powerful he is. But with that, I believe that we would never be able to have that testimony if God just automatically just snatches the storm from us. So it's one of the reasons why that we go through these storms is to, is for God to get the glory. He want, He uses what we're going through to let people know, hey, it, it is possible to get through this storm. For, for example, I, I can tell you that in my days of living in Richmond, Virginia, um, I suffer from homelessness. Um, I practically just gave up my whole life in Birmingham to to be with someone that I, I thought that uh, 
for lack of a better word, that love for me, I mean, it turned out to be uh, something else. And next thing I know, the whole bottom fell out and I find myself in an unfamiliar place. Now, for those of you who uh, live in Virginia, understand that during the winter months, it can get really cold out there. And for me not to have a home to go to, I almost died of enduring that brutally cold weather there. And I had really no one to talk to but God and only him. He was the only one that was able to bring me out uh, from that. Um, there was also a time that um, when I was younger that that people begin to label me with things that does not define who I am. Let me give an example of that. Now, I remember in grade school that uh, if you're African-American, it's, it's, it's not uh, a common thing that if you're dealing with emotional trauma or you're rebellious or you have rebellious tendencies that they just throw you into this this special category uh, or class, a special education class, if you want to put it that far. And being in that class not only caused a whole lot of embarrassment, but it caused a whole lot of depression as well, because I knew in my mind that th this is not me. This is not who I was designed to be. This, this is not my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to thrive, not just survive. And so in that, I began to act out as a cry for help. And sometimes when you're going through a mental episode and you have a mental illness, that sometimes and out of nowhere, you do things and you say things that are not common, as if you're crying out for help. The question is, who is actually listening to you? And so even at a young age, I find myself in that situation to where I was like, this is not me. This is not who I am. People are trying to define me. And this is not me. And so I dealt with a lot of depression. Um, you know, I hid a lot because I didn't want people to think that, um, you know, I was, you know, belonging to a looning house or whatever you want to call it. But in that I fought hard to discover my true identity. And in such, the good news is, is that people heard that cry for help. They said, well, this was a mistake. You really don't belong here. And I was like, well, just, just give me a chance to prove who I really am. And they did. Finally, in high school, they did. And my feet, though, high school is for four years. But I had to do four years of high school in two years. Um, that, that's a lot of classes. And plus, I was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. I had a part-time job as well. So I had to roll all of this in. And a lot of, it was like this mountain. A lot of pressure was built on me as if somebody was actually looking for me to fail. Well, guess what? Even though I wasn't saved at the time, I knew somebody was with me. Well, let me tell you what happened after that. I graduated. Um, my grade point average was over a uh, uh, 3.4 grade point average. My class was pretty large. It was pretty much almost like 500 of us. Um, I missed the honor society by two rankings. They only allowed 12 people in. I was kind of like either 13 or 14. So 
I was this close to going to the National Honor Society. And when I graduated, I graduated with honors. They said I have outperformed anybody who ever participate in the regular academic program. So we ended up graduating for honors. And out of the 476 people that graduated with me, my ranking was number 13. And I find myself in the top 2% of my class. So I say just to say this, don't let people put labels on you. Don't let people define you. You are greater than what people say you are. You are even greater than though, you are even greater than what you think of your own self. I truly believe that once we take self out of the equation, you're able to release your potential. Only you can determine who you want to be. Don't allow people to put labels on you. As an example that I just gave you, I was determined not allowing people to put labels on me. That if I put all of my mess aside, I realize where great potential that lies beneath me. But guess what? God was not finished with me yet. I mentioned earlier that I went through a period of of holy, homelessness where everybody thought it was a good idea to abandon me. Why? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it was something I said or something that I have done. There's been plenty of opportunities to where the devil could have uh, just put, uh, took me out. From the time that I was homeless to the time that I served in the military and was getting ready to uh, be deployed to the Persian Gulf, where uh, a sneaky, underhanded thing was happening to me by my superiors. I was bullied, intimidated, but I held my own. I fought to be included. And even if I I didn't, wasn't invited to the table, I built my own table. And even though I was there at that table by myself, still I was able to endure those things. What about the time that when I was working at Amazon facility outside of Virginia, where a group of county sheriff's deputies thought it was a good idea to point a gun at me. All because it was early in the morning. I worked a 10 hour shift. I was tired and was getting ready to go home. And the only thing that I was focusing on was getting on that road and going home where the police thought it was a good idea to humiliate me, send me to jail, and have some guns pointed towards me. Again, another opportunity for the devil to take me out. The plan, there was a weapon, not prevail. Uh, What about the time that I had to let some people go? Because I have chosen to stand on the truth of God's word. And that's fine with me. I accepted that. Because in order to be one of God's soldiers, As I said earlier, you have to go through something. And and everybody's not going to go with you. Some people, God would cause them to fall 
behind. And I have to accept that, that maybe these are not the people that God wants me to, to be with. He has something else better in mind. But I have chosen to follow his lead and to obey his voice. And in that, I lost a lot of people, had to let some people go. And sometimes I really don't know who to talk to or who to turn to if I'm having a problem. But I want to say this, there's nothing like having a friend in Jesus. When you're talking to Jesus, you have a friend for life. And no matter what time of the day it is, whenever when the sun comes up, it's high noon, or even those wee hours of the night to where you can't sleep, I guarantee you that if you have a talk with Jesus, you have a friend that will never leave you nor forsake you. And this is the one lesson throughout most of my life that he taught me. And in that comes my victory. Um, Keith, I'm just uh, sure you have mentioned that you had a lot of um, a lot of attacks on your identity um, as you were growing up, even in school, um, just being mislabeled um, in school uh, with, with certain education classes and, um, and just that um, the attack on your identity, it seems like it's been consistent. So how have you found uh, security in Christ? Like when did you actually, um, start to walk with Jesus? When did he become your best friend? And how did he carry you through um, like grade school and uh, and once you're out of school and in the army days? Well, I actually, uh, during my grade school years, I, I wasn't even saved. I wasn't, I wasn't saved. I didn't have a relationship with Christ. But I knew that somebody carried me through. I, I either at that time I didn't fully understand, or maybe I was in denial. But I, I, I knew there was some type of intervention. That's why I'm still here. That's why I was able to endure the identity crisis endure the threats that was put on my life, endure the socioeconomic hardships. It was couldn't be no other person on earth that could have done those things other than Christ himself. So at what, what point did you become a Christian? Like when did Jesus come into your life? It was actually when I was in uh, college uh, halfway through college, I think it was my uh, sophomore, junior year that I eventually gave my life to Christ because I saw an example of God's love in people. That's and beautiful. I was like, I wanted, you know, and I was, I was drawn to that. I was like, this is what I've been missing. Hmm. How can I have what you have? When this, when was the, you sorry, mentioned the ahead. you mentioned a period of homelessness? When was that um, relative to? Was that before you went in the army or after you got out of the army? Or after after the army. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, how did that, how did that end up turning around? I don't, I feel like that'd be really hard to endure myself. <laughs> um, so. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I truly believe that, I truly believe that, that, that happened, uh, because, uh, 
this was when I was first uh, called into the ministry, to the preaching ministry. And this is what the Lord wanted me to do. And like Jonah, I ran. I ran for two years before I finally accept, okay, this, this is what I was destined to do. So I was like, Jonah, I, you know, I ran away. Who call it me? I thought I was running away, but but you can't run from God. And so just like uh, God had to create a situation for Jonah to go into a realization that I surrender myself and my will to your will, I, I believe that this was God's way of intervening you know, to get me to see that number one, I have, you know, I have to obey him. And number two, he's teaching me to completely rely on him. I think we've all had seasons where we've been like Job and we've run away from God's calling. Like, I don't know if I can really handle that God. And he's like, nope, <laughs> this is what I have for you. This is what I have for you. Um, right, Mr. right, <laughs> and and I also heard, and I also heard some. Uh, I also heard, you know, that in the Bible that if that if you're willing to be a teacher, that you would be judged more harshly. And I was like, I don't want that. I don't. I don't. You know, I know. I'm. I know. Eventually, I'm going to be judged, but. I mean, I, I don't want to be judged in, in, in that way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. Because with that type of position or assignment, there's not only a lot of responsibility behind it, but there's also going to be a lot of accountability too. And I'm like, I don't I don't want that. I mean, I wasn't like Moses was like, well, you know, I can't really speak well. Uh, I don't have a stuttering problem. I don't have a speech impairment, so I couldn't use that excuse. Uh, but you know how we are. We always trying to make us some excuse why we don't want to do something. And then we go run and hide. I mean, we think we want it and hiding, but you can't run from God. Hmm. Well, I, I appreciate that you were thinking through the the gravity of being judged in a, at a, a higher level of accountability before the Lord, because I think sometimes we do jump into, uh, or we, we desire to be in positions uh, of being able to teach and we don't realize the accountability that comes with it. Um, the responsibility that's placed on our sh shoulders then, you know, if, if God's given us a message and we proclaim it and we share it, you know, we're responsible for that. And, and he, it's a big deal. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that you were. The, I think people are looking for, you know, they look at the, the glamour and the glory and the romance of being carriers of the word, but they have no idea what we go through on a, on a daily basis to be a bearer of the word. So we get a lot of enemies because we decided that we want to stand on God's word. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we get ignored. We don't get to be included in a lot of stuff because of our stance on God's word. And even use uh, bullying, intimidation to try to, to get us to sway us away from God's word. And I'm like this, you you can do the 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 worst possible thing to me. And I said this a lot of times, you can do the worst possible thing to me, you know, even to kill this body. That's the worst thing that you can do to me is kill this body in the worst way. But guess what? still going to stand on God's word because at the end of the day, who would I really fear? 
somebody who's going to kill this body, which I'm going to die eventually, or someone who can kill this body and my soul and be separated from the Lord forever. Who do you think I'm going to fear the most? Um, Keith, I want to play a, a snippet from a podcast you were on uh, about mental health, um, and then we'll come back. I'd love to hear more about your testimony and some victories that you've really uh, felt over the years uh, with the Lord. So, yeah. What do, you, what do you believe now? Has anything changed in terms of the state of mental health from from during the pandemic, then after the pandemic, are, are, are we in better shape now or we are in in worse shape now? What What is your state of, your well, opinion on the state of mental health? Well, if we look at mental health, I don't think things are all that much different, unfortunately. I think we still have a lot of challenges in mental health. I think a lot of people um, are, are still suffering with mental health and not getting the services uh, that they deserve. Many of those services are not available. Access to the services are not available. Uh, insurance uh, help is somewhat limited. Um, so I'm not sure we're doing all that much better when it comes to looking at the mental health crisis that we're going through. Now, there is some progress that's been made with substance abuse, particularly among teenagers. Uh, the level of, of, of substance abuse among teenagers is still high, but it is not as high as it was before the pandemic, um, except maybe for alcohol use. But a lot of the drug use that uh, the pandemic uh, caused the the the, the um, the percentage of kids using substances was was reduced because of the pandemic. Some of that is coming back, but fortunately, it is not back to where it was before the pandemic. So, for um, Keith, how how how's the pandemic played into your testimony? Um, yeah, I think that's something we haven't spoken a ton about on this podcast, but I know it's played a lot in my testimony. I'd love to hear uh, how God brought you through 2020 and uh, to where you are today. Uh, I, I uh, Well, uh, it, it was a great ride, actually. It was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, the pandemic was like really bad. I was like, get this stuff. Now, this was even the time where churches and ministries were shut down as well. So there was not not a lot of ministry and outreach that was going on. Neither, you know, and God was saying, OK, uh, this is a perfect time to test the church. And we failed. As a, as a body of Christ, we failed because we went, you know, the, the pandemic came. All the businesses shut down. And guess what? The church shut down too. But not me. I was cautious. But I was still out there. Still out there doing outreach. Because I determined that no matter what type of crisis that we're going through. And even going through our deepest, darkest moments. There's always going to be a light that's going to shine and conquer darkness. And that's one of the things that the pandemic had taught me that, hey, this is an opportunity to shine uh, the light onto darkness and to bring hope to people, which is exactly what I have done. Cautiously. But that's exactly what I've done. So I kind of really, uh, so even though the pandemic is, you know, it's bad, I'm not downplaying that. But the greatest victory of all is allow God to use me and others like me to not only to share the gospel, but to also demonstrate the gospel. And in that, so many lives have been changed. 
because I decided not to sit on the sidelines during a major health crisis. Hmm. Um, I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful. What um, what inspired the Great I Am Outreach International, and what all do you do for people? Well, I remember back in 2003, it was the summer of 2003, uh, I was, you know, laying in my apartment, you know, sleeping or, or what have you, and I heard this voice, and it says, I want you to help my people and preach my word. That became my ministry, the ministry that God has entrusted me with. And the name Great I Am pretty much says everything. When Moses uh, and God had a conversation and he said, well, who should I tell Pharaoh? Who, If Pharaoh asked, well, who are you? What should I tell them? And God's answer to Moses was, I am that I am. And we know God being the great I am. And in the name, he wanted us to demonstrate just how great he is. Well, how do you how do you do that? You demonstrate the love of God through service. So it's just, and I'm not talking about lip service. I'm actually talking about getting your hands dirty and being the boots on the ground reaching people that's what outreach is all about so in great i am ministries we we engage the community we engage the people and we're reaching out to the people whatever services that they may and may need that they need uh some food on the table or they may need to have a bill pay or they may need somebody to to talk to or they may have a uh an issue to where uh they're not able to physically do things and so we have a team to go out and we do those things so that's pretty much what great i am ministries outreach international is all about and we are in our 21st year of operation and we definitely have some challenges uh, particularly uh, funding issues. But that did not stop us from reaching out to people, forming those relationships, and meeting those needs. Because why? Because God gave us the provision. Remember, if God gives you a vision, he's going to give you the means to fulfill that vision because that's a testimony to himself and a demonstration of how great God is. Does it also help with the neighborhood revitalization that you're involved in? I guess Great I Am help with that as well, or how does that work? Uh, we, we have partnered with different organizations to uh, help make that possible. Like, for example, uh, here in Birmingham, there's... Uh, there's a group of residents. Uh, we call ourselves Birmingham United Neighborhoods or BUN for short. And they are very uh, much involved with addressing blight, dilapidated housing, and neighborhood revitalization. And through their networks and, and contacts and collaborations, it's kind of like we're just one big happy family with the common ground to not only just putting up buildings, but empowering people. So neighborhood revitalization is more than just tearing down buildings. We have, it's also tearing down our way of thinking. It's also tearing down our mindsets. It's also rebuilding morale that people will be able to, uh, to take back their communities take pride in their communities and helping one another as neighbors. So to me, that's what neighborhood revitalization does. And we just so happen to take those uh, mm -hmm. from black and white pages to actually demonstrate it. 
And guess what? It is making a difference. If I can share this with, uh, real quick, yesterday, uh, a colleague uh, and myself, we rode through our neighborhood uh, yesterday morning. We had to talk with one of the partners and he was telling us all the wonderful stuff that's happening in our community. This is what we do. And so and this is our way of interacting with people. And like I said, I want to see some dirt. And what I mean by that is that I want to see some action. Enough with this talking. Let's get our hands dirty. So that's what I mean when I say I want to see some dirt. I like that. <laughs> I like the dirt too. Let's yeah. let's see some dirt. We need to we need let's to see, see some the, dirt. <laughs> the body of Christ put into action there. Right. Yeah, like oh, that. and I also want to I also want to mention this too because I think this is a, a, a vital part of this conversation. So a couple of weeks ago in Birmingham, there was a 92-year-old lady uh, that sent out an SOS for help. And it ended up being a local news story here in Birmingham. What happened was is that she lived next door to a house that was is partially dilapidated and it had overgrown weeds. And, and she said she's been called in the city for over a year and nothing happened except the fact there was a lot of snakes and rodents in her house. And she had to make sure that they don't bite her because, you know, rats and snakes, they carry diseases, right? So when we saw this video, or I saw it on the, the article on the news, it, it really broke my heart. As a matter of fact, I really didn't get that much sleep that night. And so when I woke up Sunday morning, I was like, you know what? We cannot let this lady suffer any longer. So myself and a group of my friends, we went over to that particular neighborhood and that particular street, and we took care of the problem. We did video. We did audio. We, we, we talked to one of the neighbors who, by the way, was 98 years old and still driving. <laughs> I was like, see me in about 40, see me about 50 years. I, I said, I pray that I live that long that I still be able to drive too. But she was 98 years old and still driving. And she was, and we would say, oh, you know what? You know, we supposed to be in church today. And she was like, no, 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 no. She said, uh, she said something that was really profound. She said every day, you know, every Sunday, when we drive to church, we're actually passing the church. And I'm thinking, like, well, what do you mean? But then I realized that, hey, that, that building that we go to to worship every Sunday, that's not the church. It's a building. The people that go to that, inside that building, that is the church. So when she said that, that just like a light bulb, just click up like that. And I was like, you know what? You know, we're having church right here. We may not be inside a building, but we're having church, meaning that mm -hmm. we're out here, we're engaging the people. And when they cry out and say that I have a need and we're meeting that need, that's the church. And that should be the function of the church not 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 just preaching and teaching the word of god but actually lifting the words out of the pages and going to these communities where whether or not they they know god or not when we go and service these communities we are actually taking the word of god from the books from the pages out into the community and that's exactly what we did. Did we get mentioned on the news? No, because they don't know who we are. And that's fine. I'm, I mean, I know who we are based on the images that they show. But it's it's not about us. You know, and I'm glad they didn't mention us, you know, by name, but that's not important. The important thing is, is that we had a 92-year-old lady who was in real big trouble 
with rodents and snakes from my house next door. And a group of people who don't even live in the area decided they wanted to answer the call and perform the act. And I don't regret doing any of that. And I will not be intimidated or bullied and shamed into doing something that the Holy Spirit pricked in our hearts to do. I'm not going to do that. Ever, no matter what it is, I will not be bullied and shame intimidating for standing up for God's word and demonstrating his word. So don't try it. It's not it, it holds no water here. Because I'm going to continue to do those two things until the day that God said, Come on home. And everybody want to hear those accolades. Well done. I don't care if I don't get another pat on the back or award or nothing here on earth for the rest of my life. But when you die and say, and God said, well done, that's an accolade that nobody can take away from you. And guess what? That accolade will last for eternity. I think that's what we all want to hear. Absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm praying for it. So when she said that, it kind of brought back to what I, I said is earlier. And, you know, I'm like, well, that, that notion kind of went away because we was all saying, you know, we, we missing church. She said, no, you're not. No, you're not. We have in church right here. Because hmm. every day, every Sunday that we go to church, we pass so many opportunities or bringing the church to the people that don't come. Every Sunday we do that. And that kind of made my day right there. And guess what? Because we was out there, I was able to sleep better at night knowing that that lady wouldn't end up in the hospital or six feet under because the city of Birmingham decided that they was going to ignore this lady's problem. I'm glad God put that on your heart. You know, I, my my prayer is that people, as they kind of as they see this, um, our podcast, something that they can take away is that you know the Holy Spirit, as He puts things in your heart, ways to serve. That's a place that you're going to find healing as well, right? Like, there's something that. It's empowering when you're serving your neighbors, when you're building up the body of Christ, uh, when you're doing something for somebody who they can't help you uh, materialistically or financially or in any way. But you can bless them. You're serving them. Uh, you're being the hands and feet of Jesus to your community. Um, and that that is a way that we can find healing. I know um, it, because it's like the peace of Christ. Um, it it comes through, uh, like, I, I don't know, it, how have you experienced that? You know, like your whole ministry, I know, is like it's, a it's joy not, of service. You know, that, the, that type of word does not only bring healing to the individuals that's doing it, but it also brings healing to the people who are crying out for help. Yeah. And as I was telling one person last week, I said, uh, we got to continue to, uh, to visit these individuals. You have four people on that block that's 90 year plus. You had a 92 year old, you had a 93 year old, a 96 year old, and a 98 year old. The one that the one I kept seeing that that's still driving. She lives on that block too. So we saw a whole block being transformed by a group of people who decided to spring into action on an SOS call that this lady has been calling for help for over a year. And guess what? I can feel the difference in that whole block. Not, not just the way that it looked, but the, but the people that live on that block. It's, it's something different uh, about them. And that's what happens when we take the church out of the four walls and walk these streets, that's exactly what's going to happen. 
Amen. <laughs> uh, we need, we, I am praying that there will be more leaders like you raised up in, in our generation and in the new generations to come that really have that vision of being the hands and feet of Jesus um, to their communities uh, because we, we need that so desperately yeah. in our world. The better prayer is the, as, as Jesus puts it, uh, the harvest is plenty, mm. but the laborers are few. Yes. Let's pray that God would send more laborers out to gather the harvest. Amen. I mean, should we say, well, you know, you, you need to be belonging in the church? Not necessarily, because as that 98-year-old lady was saying, we don't have to be in a building to have church. We could be helping our neighbors. That's having church. We could be just sitting here having a conversation of like whether whether you're like-minded or not. That's that's having church. And I think that's something where the, the one of the reasons why Jesus was so annoyed by the Pharisees was the the fact that they're in this elite group and they don't want anyone else to be a part of that group. Not only that, they they don't want to go out and be a witness to God's word. Now they claim that they, you know, they claim that they know the secrets of God's word and that they were the, the teachers of the law, but they demonstrated nothing from those pages. They did it so that they can pat themselves on the back and say, I, I, I got more education than you have. But that means nothing to God. Our education, our credentials mean nothing if we're not using it to help somebody else. It means zero. I want to play a little video um, that we have of you explaining explaining and expanding on the truth and um, recognizing the real Jesus. Um, and then we'll get to some questions um, before we close. Okay. I pray that that we all will come to the truth, uh, the knowledge of Christ, and also to, you know, make sure that you're following the right Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because there seems to be, uh, there seems to be, and you know, this is real. That there seems to be uh, different forms of Christ. So make sure that you are following the right Christ. Amen. And the only way that we're able to do that is is through discernment of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And for those of you who do not have a relationship, you know, with Christ, um, I pray that you will. Mm -hmm. I pray that you will come into the knowledge of Christ. I pray that that you will you will get saved, that you will accept God's gift of salvation through Christ alone. Um, mm -hmm. It's not easy. You know, thing to do is uh, test, just like you said. No, nobody wants to be in a vulnerable state. And if I have to get psychological on y'all for a little bit, in psychology, uh, in psychology, our bodies, we crave pleasure. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, no one wants to go through anything negative no one goes wants to go through anything you know bad and our bodies we you know we fight that we, we always seek uh pleasure we don't want to be vulnerable you know but technically you know in our sins we are vulnerable you know we have to come to that realization that in our sins we are vulnerable mm -hmm. so uh and sometimes you know what we're going through may have someone else not to get into what we have got got into mm -hmm. kind of serves as a woman so um 
I have to throw that in there because, you know, when we're talking about truth, we, it, it's so many areas, you know, that we can cover. But like we have acknowledged, you know, earlier, everything that we do is different from everyone else. And, you know, what you do and what I do is, is, is vital and is important to the kingdom of God. And no, and, you know, and no two things are more, imp- no one thing is more important. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, than the other. Uh, I know people tend to, you know, to think that way. Um, but in reality, that is not the truth. It is far from the truth. So um, just want to give you that public service announcement here. Um, because in actuality, you know, we're about the Great Commission and yeah. we're looking out for yourself there's different ways that we do it but ultimately we're looking out for the souls of the people Um, now i wanted to bring it back you mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast you said you know god is looking for soldiers and so i wanted to ask you what your insight has been on spiritual warfare how god has uh, opened your eyes as to what that is, what it looks like, and um, and how we can engage in it and, and find victory in Christ. Uh. First of all, the Bible lets us know that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. He's telling us what we are wrestling against. Um, spiritual wickedness, principalities, and high places. So God tells us what we're fighting against. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you from if you're familiar with uh, the prophet uh, Samuel, the people of Israel wanted a king, and Samuel was trying to talk them out of. It, and God said, "Well, let them have what they want. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. They don't want me as their king. They want someone. They want a human being." to rule over them. So don't take that personally because if they rejected Christ, if we are in Christ, they're going to reject you too. And Paul said a lot of times, well, count that, you know, all joy. What do you mean count that all joy? You want me to be happy of the fact that I'm being ridiculed, mocked, and rejected? Yeah. Because guess what? You are set apart. You was once of the world, but you no longer are part of the world. So don't take it personally that people are rejecting you. Because they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting Jesus. So don't take that personally. That's number one. Number two, he tells us how to become victorious in spiritual warfare. For starters, in Ephesians Chapter six, he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. So what's the what's the whole armor of God? It could be the, the the sword, which is the word of God, the shield of the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the crown, which is the gospel of peace. All of the all of those things. So and this isn't God is equipping us to fight this spiritual warfare. First, he tells us that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Second of all, he's telling us to put on the whole armor of God and even give us the pieces of what that armor looks like. So we now, so yeah, then he tells us that who we're fighting against. He tells us who the enemy is. He's given us the armor that we need to fight this spiritual warfare. And then finally, he tells us but that the weapons of this world are not carnal. So the weapons that we have are, are not worldly. They're divine. They're godly. And only these weapons that I just mentioned early in Ephesians 
are the only things that we can use besides prayer and fasting. Uh, those are weapons too, as well, that we can use to fight off spiritual wickedness. But these things are made mighty through God to what? To pull down those strongholds and combat anything that's been said or done that's contrary to God's word. So if you want to have victory over spiritual and spiritual warfare, that's it. Those three things. God tell us who the enemy is. He's already given us the, the weapons and the tools that we need to fight the wiles of the devil. And then he tell us what those weapons are designed to do. So if we follow those three patterns right there, we can have victory over spiritual wickedness and we can win this, this battle of spiritual warfare. I think there's so much correlation with our mental health things that go on and uh, spiritual warfare issues that are going on. And so I just really appreciate people who can help us engage in the spiritual battle. Um, it just, it's good to know that God is over even all of our, all of the, attacks on our mind, all of the attacks on our spirit and our soul, you know, God, God knows them, them, and he's in control o over all of them, over all of the attacks of the enemy. And so any, I, I love that you, you, you know, we went straight to Ephesians six and like, this is our weapons of warfare. This is how we engage in the battle. So, um, and I would be uh, a disservice if I didn't say this. Do, do you know that sin and wrongdoing and the transgressions that we do, it starts right here? Hmm. It's it starts in, in it starts in the starts in the mind. I wrote a paper about that when I was at Liberty University. And one of the things I said was uh when we going through mental illness we're actually going through uh an episode of spiritual warfare that's going on in our minds because we're battling against what is reality versus what is not reality and what is spiritual so all of this is going through our head when we're dealing with a mental illness because it's being triggered by something that that was said or something that was done in the past that's what i wrote about and i got in a lot of trouble i got a lot of trouble for that but guess what i backed it up with the word of god i got in a lot of trouble for writing that paper and they was gonna kick me out of school be, because of that as well until my professor after he read the paper he said you know what i i thoroughly read this paper and i was like you are absolutely right. Every, every action, every sin that we ever committed starts right here. And mm -hmm. we're and we're wrestling with it in our mind. That's why that's that's why God says that we need to be transformed. Our mind needs to be renewed mm -hmm. daily. And that's why it's so important to be connected to the vine, because that's because just like uh, uh, you eat foods uh, that sustain our bodies, or you uh, get you take vitamins, supplements, so that we can remain healthy and strong. Well, when we're connected to Christ, who says He's divine, that's where we get all of our spiritual nutrients from. So we we get the, the the mind regulator. So uh, we get the heart fixers, you know, turning that stony heart into a soft heart, to the point that we be able to listen to what God has to say and obey Him. 
you know, to the point that he puts in our spirit that, hey, you need to pray with somebody or somebody needs help. All those wonderful is, is, is where the Holy Spirit can pump us with our information that we need to know to live holy. It's where we get our ammunition from to fight off the devil. Oh, and the greatest weapon of all is to resist the devil. That's the greatest weapon that we have. But how do we know that if we don't stay connected to the vine? Because mm. remember, you know, that scientists say that you uh you can you be your body can be in trouble if you don't drink water for three days, or if you don't eat, I mean, you don't eat for seven days and you don't drink water for three days. Well, how much more in trouble that you're gonna get if you're not con if you're disconnected from the vine? Remember, I said that's where you get all your spiritual nu nutrients from, right? So if you're disconnected from the vine for a long time, what do you think is gonna happen to you? Hmm. You're gonna go through this, this uh, you're gonna go through this, this this episode where you feel like you're gonna lose your mind and it's going to cause you to do something that ultimately is going to end up being at sin. Remember I said before that everything starts right here in the mind. And if we don't allow God to regulate our minds, we're going to end up doing something that we're going to regret. And believe me, there are consequences for that and they are not good. Yeah. Um. What um what have been some of your life? How has your faith allowed you to face the challenges that you've had? I know you've, you know, as someone who's like an army veteran, you've looked at PTSD and things, and then there's you know, you you mentioned like a lot of loneliness and depression from your even childhood. Um. How is how's faith a enabled you to overcome those things? So when, when you have a relationship with God, um, he's kind of like the, the the friend that you always wanted. He's there to comfort you. He's he's there to to give you instruction. He's there to hold you accountable. And he's also there just just to listen. You know, it doesn't have to be all fancy words and whatnot. Just let it out straight from here, straight from your heart. Holy Spirit knows what you are in need of. And sometimes we don't know how to pray. And so when we allow the Holy Spirit to take over, he will make sure that your request gets to God. And then we have to trust the process that God is going to handle that situation. That's when I do when I feel like that everything 